Egoism. Often referred to as an off-compass libertarian code of ethics, it's often mysterious to those who first encounter it. It's hotly debated as to how it is applicable in a societal context, but one thing is indeed for certain. Max Stirner was kind of a dick. And he was completely fine with that. Now, please bear in mind, this video essay is really meant to be taken as an introduction to egoism and the various thinkers that subscribe to the concept. So, while it is a very nuanced concept, there will be some simplifications. That being said, I am your favorite armchair philosopher, Mr. Minarchist. So, why don't you grab a glass of milk and join me in analyzing the various phantasms and or spooks of egoism. Egoism is present in a number of political ideologies, primarily anarchist movements, but it first appeared in the mid-19th century as a philosophical movement. Now, before I get into the philosophy and ideology of egoism, there is an important distinction to make, that being the normative and descriptive approach to understanding it. Now, if you're familiar with philosophy, you'll know what I'm referring to when I say normative and descriptive, but if you don't, not to worry. Mr. Minarchist has got you covered. Here's the rundown. It's essentially a method in which we judge ethical philosophy. Descriptive ethics is all about examining a theory without making any judgments as to the moral value, so the descriptive doesn't really care if it's right or wrong. And normative ethics is, well, the opposite. It focuses not in describing the theory, but evaluating the right and the wrong in it, or simply put, making moral judgments and prescribing what ought to be done. I know, I'm oversimplifying a rather complicated concept, but it gets the job done. Egoism is simply the theory that all of humanity is, by their base nature, selfish. With that out of the way, let's get to dissecting. Why do we even exist? Why do food YouTubers use black gloves? Stop it! What is grandma really hiding, other than a crappy mobile game? What motivates people to do what they do? These questions form the basis of more philosophies than I care to count. It's just all about the human condition, man. And egoists strive to answer that last question. Descriptive egoism can be separated into two categories, default and psychological. Default egoism is the notion that human beings are self-serving and purely self-interested by default. It assumes that we make decisions in our day-to-day -day lives based on self-preservation and self-interest. A good example on how this idea is presented could be found in philosopher Thomas Hobbes' work, Leviathan. He describes human nature as being fixated on survival and thus self-preservation. He goes into this further, stating that the reason we form societies and codes of law and authority is to counter this default selfishness and stop us from being lawless barbarians. And in his words, without them, the human condition would be, quote, nasty, brutish, and short. Anyway, default egoism is a flexible notion, because while it recognizes that we are selfish by default, this doesn't necessarily mean we are unable to act selflessly, or take the well-being of others into account. Now, psychological egoism is a touch different. It is the notion that no matter what you do, no matter how selfless it might be perceived, no matter how much one claims their selfless act is genuine, it's not. And the reason why it's not is perhaps our foolish monkey brains are just naturally incapable of acting altruistically. For example, say you perform some act of kindness or charity. Well, a psychological egoist would say that's because of an underlying selfish motive. Genuine altruism, in which you act solely for the benefit of others, is considered impossible by adherents of psychological egoism. An example of this idea forms the entire concept behind Ayn Rand's 1964 work, The Virtue of Selfishness. In this work, Rand argues that we are incapable of acting truly altruistically, and that we betray our base human emotions when we do, and that when we are acting in a so-called selfless manner, we do so to feel good about ourselves or to relieve ourselves of a perceived moral guilt. This also forms a big part in Rand's own philosophy, objectivism, which I won't go too much into as that'll be a video on its own. In short, default egoism theorizes that we are largely self-serving and animalistic creatures. 
and one might say that we form societies and laws to counteract that barbaric side of human nature. Psychological egoism theorizes that human nature, and therefore our actions, are rooted entirely in having selfish motives, but that the outcomes of these motives aren't necessarily always good or bad, but morally gray. Ah, now, the more interesting part in my opinion, as I mentioned earlier, the normative approach to understanding egoism is in measuring the two morals. This notion can be split into two categories, ethical and rational egoism. Eh, let's start with ethical. For example, whereas someone who subscribes to the notion of psychological or default egoism might say, yeah, everyone is just selfish by their very nature, those ethical egoists would answer that with, yeah, and you should be. Rational egoism is exactly what it sounds like. Whereas default and psychological egoism claims that we act in our self-interest by our own base human nature and ethical egoism claims we act out of self-interest and that it's our moral obligation to do so, rational egoism is similar to the ethical interpretation, and it only differs in that it claims that we should only act in our own self-interest, logically and reasonably. So, while adherence of egoism may sound like your typical 15-year-old Reddit douchebag who just discovered philosophical justification for acting like a douche, I believe there is merit to these ideas. Let's take another look at Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism is deeply rooted in rational egoism. Whereas ethical egoism proposes that we act out of self-interest and that it ought to serve as the only moral guide, Rand places more emphasis on the pursuit of happiness as our moral guide. Yes, that's still a selfish endeavor, but as we can tell from the title of her work, The Virtue of Selfishness, she implies that it's not morally bad to act selfishly. She touches on this in her first essay, The Objectivist Ethics, in which she argues that rational egoism is by living honestly, uncompromisingly, productively, and independently. And to embark upon something like self-sacrifice is to compromise one's integrity. In short, being true to oneself and pursuing one's happiness. So then, what of ethical egoism? What examples do we have? Well, <laughs> we'll have to examine the man behind the concept of egoism itself. You long for freedom, you fools. If you took might, freedom would come of itself. Max Stirner. Johann Kaspar Schmidt, known to us as Max Stirner, was a pioneer in defining egoism as it's known now. As to his life, he wasn't a very noteworthy man, and he'd have hated to have even been called a philosopher. But like many philosophers, it's a rare thing that they get recognition in their lifetimes, and Stirner is no exception. He wasn't an ivory tower professor, and he didn't stand out in his studies or works at the time. He just ran his failing milk shop and attended debates from time to time. Also, there are no known photographs of the man. All depictions of him stem from a sketch doodled up by the bearded bathless commie otherwise known as Friedrich Engels. I mean, that's a joke, but ain't I right? Anyway, do with that information what you will. Best known for his work, Der Insiege und sein Eigentum, often translated as the ego and its own, is essential to understanding ethical egoism, or at least Stirner's take on it. Now, while most philosophers are depressing and reading their bone-dry work is a tedious thing, I mean, when you read them, you really have to want to understand their nuanced and multifaceted ideas. Or you could just watch Mr. Minarchist. Anyway, Stirner's philosophy dials that depressing worldview up to 11. Stirner was a member of the Young Hegelians, a group of intellectuals that were influenced by German philosopher Hegel. I won't get into Hegel. I doubt there's a platform out there which accommodates the sheer length of a video on Hegel. Either way. In The Ego and Its Own, Stirner presents several central ideas. Let's break it down. Stirner believed that individuals were far too complex to truly understand beyond generalizations, and he blames this on the failures of society and on the limits of language itself. And this is where his ideas of ownness came in, as he felt it is truly impossible to really define individuals and that it's really up to the individual to define themselves. <laughs> 
In short, he believed that people are far too difficult to understand, and thus any attempts to generalize the human condition was nonsensical. Which, I mean, is fair. He also goes into how we are selfish by nature, and that we very well ought to be. That it is the only moral compass we need, and even then, that moral compasses don't really exist. Yeah, Stirner thought these things ought to be ignored, because truth doesn't exist outside of the individual, only the ego exists, and he believed one must reject anything outside of the ego. This is where what Stirner describes as phantasms of the mind come in. He describes the tenets of classical liberalism, the concept of state, and the notion of property rights as phantasms, or rather, spooks. As he proposes, these concepts have about the same effect on individuals as, say, a ghost haunting you. Which is to say, only if you believe a ghost is haunting you. And Stirner asks why we even need these phantasms. Pfft, morality, that's a spook. Property, that's a spook. Religion, that's a spook. Culture and traditions, spook. Your wife, whom you happen to have taken out life insurance for two weeks after she miraculously vanished without a trace and also changed her will at the last minute, making you the sole beneficiary. Nope, that wasn't fate, just a spook. Also, fate is definitely a spook. Well, he delved much more deeper than that, but you get the point. The ego and its own champions the idea of one's self-interest as the ultimate motivation. It questions serving anything but the ego and one's own desires and goals. And I mean from his perspective, concepts like law, authority, religion, society. He's right in saying that these aren't tangible things. These are ultimately things that only exist so long as there are other individuals propping them up. The legality or sinfulness of an action are only illegal or sinful when they are labeled that way. He also proclaimed that the concept of property doesn't exist because in order to own property, there needs to be a higher authority that confirms that it's ours. And the way Stirner saw it, you really only own property when you have the ability to take and defend it. These ideas form the foundation of his book, The Ego and Its Own. And this was indeed a very simplified overview. However, if perhaps you want a more comprehensive look at them, dear viewer, then I'll be linking the full book in the description. Uh, check it out. It's free. Stirner would go on to introduce these ideas to the circles he moved in. His associates, including himself, were all members of the aforementioned Young Hegelians. This group featured familiar folks such as Ludwig Feuerbach, Friedrich Engels, Karl Marx, amongst a great many others. And they all treated Stirner's ideas with a modicum of respect, but that didn't mean they were exactly popular. But as Stirner himself said, were that my ideas would cause endless wars and bring about the collapse of generations, I would still be inclined to share them. Max Stirner. He uh, also used pen names to respond to his critics as to pretend he didn't care about it all that much. So uh, <laughs> yeah, he was one of those. Stirner found no solutions in the ideals of communism or socialism. He despised capitalism, and he himself was no anarchist. Although many anarchists would later use his work as justification for their actions, but we'll get into that soon enough. But these ideas Stirner opposed were far too revolutionary in his eyes, and to him, revolutions were useless spooks. Stirner saw revolutions as attempts to replace the old order of society with new orders that really weren't all that new. For example, you can topple a state that uses, say, religious institutions and traditions to enforce the laws of that culture, and replace it with an atheistic society. But Stirner claims that those traditions and laws are just replaced with new traditions and laws that are just as spooky as the last, and holds the individual in the same regard. In short, he dismissed revolutionaries as dismantling higher hierarchy and replacing it with the same hierarchy, just under a different name. Instead, Stirner believed that hierarchical society could be replaced with what he called the Union of Egoists. Despite Stirner's rejection of classical liberalism, well, he was alive in the early 19th century, so I guess he would have just called it liberalism. His idea of the Union of Egoists is why his philosophy is associated with libertarianism and anarchism. The Union of Egoists is essentially an unfixed system in which individuals continually consent to cooperating with other individuals free from laws, institutions, and other such spooks. As to Stirner, he sure lived by his ideals. He would die in 1856, and just when he and his work were all but forgotten, they'd be revived little more than 30 years after his death. 
Right, now that I've cleared up the philosophy of egoism and exactly what it is, let's get into the juicy political ideologies Stirner influenced. But first, how is it that Stirner didn't end up just being forgotten? Well, you can thank Scottish-German author John Henry Mackay for that. It is often said that, to Mackay's labors, we owe all we know of a man who was as absolutely swallowed up by the years as if he had never existed. Mackay was a fascinating man, and it's possible his revival of egoism was in part due to his rejection of the morals of the time, as he was known to, um, disregard the law. Yeah. Why don't you, uh, make yourself at home here? Have a seat which led him finding justification in his actions through the works of Stirner. After all, legal institutions are just a spook, I guess. Anyway, it's thanks to McKay that Stirner's work now comprises more than ethical philosophy, but political ideology. Anarcho-egoism is a political ideology that believes in individual sovereignty and complete rejection of any form of authority. And I know what you're thinking, dear viewer. Wait, that just sounds like anarchism. Well, yes, but also no. Now, while anarcho-syndicalism or anarcho-communism might advocate for the individual against the state, they both emphasize that this is only possible by replacing it with institutions of collective ownership, and governed by communal decision-making. In fact, most iterations of traditional anarchism are defined by their advocacy of communal rule, whereas anarcho-egoists and their, shall we say, might-equals-right worldview would collide with that. And this is definitely where egoist anarchy separates from the wider anarchist movement. So what forms do egoistic anarchism take on? Well, Stirner's philosophy was popularized by McKay, whose own ideas became the framework for what is now known as queer anarchism. Mind you, it's no secret that in the late 19th to early 20th centuries, gay people had many challenges laid out before them. They had to hide their lifestyles or else be punished by a public that considered them mentally ill. And when Stirner's concept of egoism was brought back into the public consciousness, a philosophy that declared that the only moral compass one needed was acting in your self-interest and also declared legal authority and the concept of society as a whole ought to be disregarded entirely, it is then no wonder why so many disillusioned gay people became interested in it. It was a philosophy that proclaimed the individual as sacrosanct, converted into a political ideology, and while Stirner never explicitly addressed homosexuality, he made his views on the autonomy of the individual clear, and so a subset of anarcho-egoism blossomed. But queer anarchism would not be the only movement with such a notion. Legalism. Whereas egoism isn't really a political ideology, but a code of ethics, legalism would be the praxis, so to speak, which is to say egoism in practice. First appearing in European countries like France, Switzerland, and Italy in the mid-1890s, it is a form of anarchist individualism. It's essentially embracing crime as a lifestyle, and while this is what appealed to the queer anarchist movement, this is only because a major piece of their personal lifestyles were illegal. Now, both were obviously influenced by Stirner, because when you believe the state is a spook, then why should you follow the law? That was the thought behind the works of Renzo Novatore. Oh, excuse me. Renzo Novatore! An Italian anarchist author who believed in revolting against any and every oppressive system. Novatore and his ideas were inspired by Max Stirner and, and Friedrich Nietzsche. A uh, side note here. You may have noticed I've left out Nietzsche, and that was intentional because while his views do have some overlap with the topic at hand, I'd rather dedicate a whole video on his work rather than relegate him to a footnote. Anyway, Novatore believed in radical individualism, free from spooks like price tags and layaway. And speaking of embracing crime as a lifestyle, with an egoist spin on things, I have to mention the Bonnot Gang, or Bonnot, uh, I don't know. It was a French anarchist band that robbed industrialists. Not like Robin Hood, they just did it because they could. <laughs> 
They were rebels without a cause, and they believed in doing so in their own self-interest, and they are often used as an example of one of the many outcomes of embracing the philosophy of Stirner's egoism. So if you need more examples of illegalist societal worldviews, then pause this video, log into GTA Online, and wait until you get griefed one or two times and you'll have a pretty solid idea. Moving on. Now this movement is a touch obscure. Turns out you know more about a philosophy when the philosopher died centuries ago. And this one is a touch new. I mean, it's literally called post-leftism, but I digress. This is more of an anarchist movement, but egoism plays a major role in its foundation. In the interest of time, I'll just explore its relevance to Stirner's ideas. Basically, rather than the communal-oriented ideals of traditional anarchism, or most left-wing ideologies for that matter, post-left schools of thought can be considered a form of libertarian. Kinda. Let me explain. It's a wide range of ideologies that essentially believe in individual liberties, but they aren't so keen on laissez-faire capitalism. They, like Stirner, critique the whole concept of ideology, except they just call them dogmas rather than spooks. You know like most normal people. They aren't really aligned with more traditional left-wing ideas, as they believe them to be outdated and limited, particularly in a modern context. They don't believe in anarchist organizations, as they believe they are revolutionaries that only mean to replace a hierarchy with another one. Uh, see the resemblance? Anyway, they aren't collectivists, and they place emphasis on the individual. They think that social struggles are far more broad than the divide between bourgeois and proletariat, and they also refuse to work. Big surprise there. Anyway, imagine Stirner if he was a hippie and you pretty much got it. The thinker behind post-leftism that is most influenced by Stirner is most probably Hakim Bey, who theorized the concept of temporary autonomous zones, so he would have been proud of everyone's favorite failed SoundCloud rapper and temporary warlord, Raz Simone. Yeah, remember Seattle during the summer of 2020? What a summer. Anyway, that kind of shows how successful these ideas would be. Anyway, I think we'll stop here. What a rabbit hole. So what did you think, dear viewer? Did Stirner's ideas have merit? Is the concept of psychological egoism realistic? Is everyone motivated by selfishness? Let me know what you think in the comments below. I would normally go into my personal take on the subject, however, I'll save that for my next video, which is related to this. I'll be delving into Ayn Rand's objectivism next time. Join in, it'll be fun. Anyway, toodaloo. Oh wait, that's not my exit line. Uh, oh yeah, I've been Mr. Minarchist. Keep your heads on a swivel out there. It's a big, big world.